So, Adam, Jonathan, fantastic to get you guys together to discuss, well, broader issues in sports law and what is happening in the global sports market and what the sports executives and the sports lawyers who support them uh, can do uh, going forward to basically help their sport grow and develop or their organisation. Now, obviously, you two are famous in your own right, but you're both obviously famous for what is the Bible, a Bible of sports law, the Lewis and Taylor publication. I'm delighted to say that both of you have been working tirelessly in the background with your authors who have co contributed to the fourth edition. First of all, what on earth <laughs> made you think that was a good idea? <laughs> given that it's 2000 words plus and then secondly if it's at all possible can you tell us about what you would think are the sort of key new features of the book and why they've been introduced so I know that there's some stuff on esports you've had to deal with obviously the pandemic and we've had Brexit Adam I'll go to you first and then to John well I, well, I think what we had to balance was the fact that the sector is maturing, so a lot of the legal principles are becoming slightly more established, but at the same time, there are a lot of developments. And so, for example, in the doping chapters, we had to go into a, a, a great deal of detail into a lot of very new considerations. Whereas in, for example, the challenges section, the principles were becoming slightly more established and slightly clearer, and we were able to retrench in that context. And at the same time, obviously, you have to take on board that there are uh, changes in the sector altogether with things like esports coming in and uh, that it's necessary to, to, to address that. So the, the, overall, the overall aim is to make it a useful work so that somebody can pick it up and they can get what they want. And, in, in some contexts, that means that we can cut back slightly. In another context, it means we have to expand. And in other contexts, it means we have to introduce entirely new things. So at the end of the day, the aim is to just make it useful. Well, I, I can say that it certainly is useful. John? Well, you know, I would echo that. I mean, we've been doing, I think, the, when was the first edition, Adam? Was it 2000? Somewhere around there. Early 2000s, wasn't it? I'm not quite sure exactly. Was it 2004? Was it? Can't have been that. Uh, maybe, maybe. Anyway, I've got one here. I could have a look in a minute. Um, but the idea was always it's a practitioner's work. And we've proven that it, it works because I tell you what, I have a copy in my office and I refer to it quite a lot, right? And so does the sports team here and I'm sure the sports team at Blackstone and others. And... Every now and again, I get on Zoom with people and I see it in the back of, background for them as well. So I do hope and I think, you know, I've, sometimes I meet people I've never met before and they say, ah, Lewis and Taylor, it's a good book. So we do think it's of practical use. I have to say, it's why did we, why did we think it was a good idea to do a new edition? I have to say my feelings about that changed over time because it was quite so, such hard work. But the answer is that every time you do a new edition, you improve what happened before. And then at the end of it, you say, yeah, maybe we could have done that. Maybe we could have done this. Or you're working away and you think, you know what? We really need, we need, we need a chapter on this. So, for example, I am a firm opponent of anything to do with data protection law. I refuse to read the International Standard for Protection of Privacy of Personal Information. I um, think it is all an absolute outrage. However, I have to accept that those working in sport, both on the regulatory side and on the commercial side, need to know something about data protection. And so that's why we have a new standalone um, chapter from Emma Drake at Bird and Bird, who helped to uh, get the, um, the spe special provisions in the, in the UK uh, legislation that implemented GDPR to help sports bodies to share information for regulatory purposes. So she was able to bring some real expertise there. And I, I hate to say it, but I think I am going to have to refer to that chapter because it is just a, a fact of life now that we're, we're all marching to the data protection beat rather than it marching to ours. Um, the, other, the other things, well, first of all, Adam is being very uh, shy and modest as always. The reason there haven't been many um, changes to the challenges chapter, and he, he wrote that back in 2004 and it was new ground. 
it was literally charting the unknown. Now it's not, but one of the reasons it's not is because people have used what he did and have cited it in various cases, has been accepted in various cases, sometimes cited against him, which I know he finds irritating, but nevertheless, um, it has become the orthodoxy. And really that's what the book's about, is to try and map uncharted territory and give people at least what Blackstone, Bird and Bird and many other contributors are doing. And, it's, and we do know that it's people who are practicing it every day of the week. And if they think it's useful, then it probably is. Now, we'll find out, won't we, whether, whether other people do. The, the new part, so there's the data protection, there's the doping has been changed, as Adam says, for some infuriating reason. And that's right, it must have been first edition 2004, because every bloody edition has come out just before a new world anti-doping code. So you have to completely rewrite the doping. It drives me utterly mad. But we have done that. Um, We've got a new chapter, a standalone chapter on misconduct, because there are more and more times where you're finding ethics code cases or cases about not on field, more off field conduct, um, you know, misuse of social media or saying the wrong thing. There are a number of different, in many ways, the cases are about different topics, but there's a theme runs through them. And it was very useful. Kendra Potts and her colleagues put together a very good chapter that collected that together. And when you do that, you begin to see some themes. There's a new chapter on um, drafting good regulations, uh, which Adam and I did with Charles Flint. And what was interesting about that was there's the first time we think that anyone has really tried to collect together the general principles of law that the CAS says in the Edict case are applied by the CAS, whether you want them to be or not. So it's all very well for us English lawyers or Swiss lawyers or others to say, well, we know that these rules are written under English law or Swiss law. But if the CAS is going to apply general principles of law, then it might be good if we all knew what those were. So we collected together all of those cases. And it is helpful. It is just, the, you know, I'm sure people will find other cases. I'm sure there'll be other developments. But at least we've, the, the, the globe is no longer a, a gray area there that says there be monsters. Instead, we have at least mapped it out and it's the first resource. So I do see these additions as being a, a developing process um, and improving on the last. I have to say the reason that they're seven years apart is because it takes us about three years to forget how miserable it was and then about four years to get it done. But and, uh, you know, we do hope that it, it, it we, we, we think it's much better. We think it's useful. I'm sure that I'll be referring to it a lot. And if other people do too, then we'll have succeeded. Well, I think it's a, it's an, it is an impressive piece of work by everyone involved. Um, you know, you know just, just going through looking at the contributors and looking for the topics. And I, and I did spot the, the new misconduct uh, section, which I thought was, was, was particularly um, interesting. In just terms of the, the new... first edition. Hmm. 2003. Go on then. Roll a drum. 2003. 2003. Well done, Adam. <laughs> Sorry, sorry. <laughs> That's um, all right. Um, so you, you mentioned there's sort of the issues around misconduct. Uh, what other sort of important regulatory challenges have you seen since the last edition? And has there been, you mentioned that there hasn't been too much of a shift in some of these challenges, but Adam, maybe, you know, has there, have there been any shifts in a particular, you know, adoptions of particular provisions in sports regulation? So I think what I have seen certainly is a much greater preparedness by clubs and athletes to an extent, but certainly by clubs in, in the sports where there's a deal of money, to question not only the application of rules to them, but actually the validity of the rules as a whole. And um, so the phenomenon has been a, a much greater preparedness to litigate over matters which traditionally might have been regarded as falling within the, the clear purview of the, of the sports governing body to just get on with and, and, and regulate. And, and now people are saying, well, actually, you've gone too far. You've stepped outside the bounds of what's reasonable for you to, uh, to, to, to the steps that it's reasonable for you to take in relation to a particular issue. And so salary caps, financial fair play have been a, a, a very specific example of that. So what we see is clubs 
being prepared to not only say, actually, you just got it wrong in this instance, but also to say, look, these rules as a whole are, are wrong. Now, as a, somebody acting for a governing body, one can get very annoyed with the um, huffing and puffing of the people trying to blow the house down. Um, um, but one shouldn't at the end of the day, because um, even if one calls the huffers and the puffers the big bad wolf, they're not actually, they're just acting in accordance with the interests of, of their particular individual club and then making the arguments that are available to them. And governing bodies as the three little pigs have got to make sure that they build a better house. So, the, the... Adam, I've got to interrupt you. Sean, this is what someone when they said, I have principles, but if you don't like those, I have others. That's what Adam is referring to here. He, he acts on both sides of the divide. Okay, so that's the, that, that is the principled stance he's trying to stake out here with his three little pig story. No, I think even if <laughs> I think even if one were, I, I do act on both sides, and it's fair to say I'm probably increasingly acting on the governing body side now, much to, to a much greater extent than than perhaps I used to. But, Which is a relief for the for the governing body, <laughs> so I can tell you. But, but 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 the point has got to be that the that that as legal norms change, and they do change, and the extent to which. Uh, courts and, and tribunals are prepared to intervene in the way in which a governing body regulates a sport. As that's increased, then it's perfectly legitimate for people to mount their challenges in accordance with the principles that are uh, run by the courts and run by um, the arbitrators. Now, it can be very annoying as a sports governing body, I fully accept, but the fact of the matter is those are the legal principles, and what sports governing bodies have got to make sure that they do is they've got to make it work and they've got to build a better house to start off with so that the house isn't something that's vulnerable to challenge and in some contexts people are getting much better at that and an example is how the Premier League steered its way through the pandemic this time which has been I mean I was involved so obviously I might think this but 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 it, it's been exemplary because we there have a, a situation where you have a large number of clubs, all of whom have very different interests. And why shouldn't they have those different interests? Why shouldn't they pursue their own interests? Why shouldn't they act in their own interests? That's what they're there to do. And what you have to do as a sports governing body is to balance all these competing rights, is to do it in a way uh, that is legally defensible. And that's why at the end of the day, through that pandemic, despite the fact that there were a large number of clubs who had differing, differing interests and had um, uh, complaints at various times about various aspects of, of what was done, there was no litigation at the end of it. And that has been an extraordinary achievement. And, and what, 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 what has to happen in, in, in most contexts, it seems to me, in order for us to as governing bodies to defend against um, uh, the sort of challenges that, that are being seen at the moment, it, it, the, 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 just a better house has to be built. And it's not so, hard. So, 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 Adam, so brilliant, you just said it's not hard. So what is the approach? So when you're looking at this then, so I, I love this as a, you, you know, I'm a big believer obviously in transparency and accountability. And I, you know, some, one of the shifts that I've definitely seen is you know, many organizations move to a much more transparent model, such as the FA publishing their decisions, which has been very welcomed. And, it's, and that's enabled the market, has enabled the participants in, you know, whether it is the athletes or the agents or the clubs, to, to actually be more informed about what their rights are and what they can appeal against. But in terms of, um, you know, you're saying that, you know, governing bodies should embrace this is in the sense of your, your rules are there to be challenged as such. And then, you know, if you've drafted them correctly, and they've been you've had stakeholder engagement then they should you know meet those challenges and if not you know uh then you have to change them but you just said it was really simple well it, why is it really simple then and how can governing bodies make sure they've got this solid house as you referred to yeah. well so whatever the basis the putative basis of challenge that might be brought in in the future whether it's competition law or whether it's on some other basis at the end of the day, the real question when a body such as a sports governing body is imbued with a degree of power, whether through the contractual arrangements that the clubs make, for example, or through 
um, the membership structures, all simply because it's been there for a long time. Whatever the basis for the challenge, the, the test is really whether or not it's pursued a legitimate aim and it's done so in a proportionate manner, taking into account the interests of others. And if it has done that, unless it's departed from an express obligation in its rules, if it has done that, it seems to me to be very difficult to second guess it. So if you as a governing body say, well, we want to have rules about this, you listen to what people say, and then you produce the rules, and the rules are based on your evaluation and your expertise and experience of what the circumstances are, uh, and you set the rules then at that point, then there is going to be less room, a great deal less room, for the sort of challenges that, that have been seen recently. So what, what has happened, in a sense, is that in the past, the courts were perfectly prepared to say sports governing bodies should be allowed to get on with running the sport. And there wasn't really much of a mechanism that allowed people to say, well, they've got it wrong in the way they did it. There, there, were, there were some mechanisms, but not much. But as the law has changed and there is a greater preparedness by tribunals and um, and, and, and courts to intervene in the decision-making of the sports governing body, then the point at which they're willing to say, well, hang on a minute, that's really up for the sports governing body has just moved. And so we, as sports governing bodies, have to move with it. So we have to move to the position where uh, the, 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 the steps that are necessary in order to lead the tribunal to say, well, beyond that, it's a matter for the sports governing body, that they're actually fulfilled. Uh, I can jump in there as well, Adam, because what we tried to do in the chapter I mentioned about drafting good regulations is try and help the governing body to think about it up front, always better. Um, and we identified the various legitimate objectives that courts and commissions and regulators have acknowledged. And we tried to set out the both the sort of procedural due process requirements and the substantive requirements about proportionality and respect for fundamental rights. And all of the, all of the other tripwires, like not, not um, regulating retrospectively, respecting vested rights. There's a series of them. Um, and we would regard that as a sort of a guide through the minefield. Doesn't, doesn't stop, you know, it ultimately, as Adam says quite rightly, it's about if you identify an objective that you say it's necessary to um, regulate to achieve, and if you do a proper proportionality exercise, well, not only should you be able to defend yourself, but if you're doing your job as a governing body, you've got to pass that regulation and, and, and go ahead and defend it. It's one of the issues I have with some governing bodies is they're very scared to put their head above the parapet, which is understandable, but that's not their job. Their job is to do what is necessary. When the, the, the other aspect of proportionality, one aspect is not going further than is necessary to achieve the proportionate uh, legitimate objective. The other one is going as far as is necessary to achieve that objective. And that, that's the one that gets forgotten a bit. In, in I know, yeah, you brought, you brought that up before when we spoke, and I think it's a great point. Um, so it sounds to me like you've basically created a great legal framework that people can follow. But for also underlying this, it does seem that there's a good bit of uh, you know, what would say stakeholder engagement, communication and diplomacy that needs to be deployed at the same time. So if you combine the, both of those elements together, you should be in for a much better time as a governing body. Come moving on, um, obviously just over, obviously you said it's 2014, the last edition, I think it was, um, and here we are now, but even just over the last 12 months, we've had very significant cases. We've had the, obviously the Wadi Rusada, now literally a week before we're doing this, um, interview even this week I think it was uh, the uh, Athletics Integrity Unit published their decision on cases to do with the Russian Athletics Federation had Man City and the FFP case Chelsea and the transfer of minor case Blake Lepus and Yang Chipia out of the plethora of cases that have happened keynote cases it seems this year for you what would you say are the most notable cases and why you first on me Adam well, I think you, John, seeing as those are virtually all your cases. <laughs> no, there's a couple of them I'm involved in. Um, Wada Rusada is actually very interesting because it was a recommendation that a committee I chaired, uh, and that recommendation was accepted by the Wada Executive C 
committee, that that decision was then challenged. And I spent a week in Lausanne listening to teams of about 10 different teams of lawyers telling the court how uh, the, the rules that I drafted, the International Standard for Co-Compliance by Signatories, and the decision that we, the recommendation we made based on those rules, contravened every legal norm known to man, which was, you know, I felt, I felt that was a bit unfortunate. Fortunately, all of those challenges got rejected. There was, however, a proportionality analysis at, at the end of it, which, which I was sorry about. Um, you know, in short, for those, I think most people are familiar with Wada v. Rusada. Um, but the, the, the CAS accepted, there was some incredible work done by Wada um, intelligence and investigations to get the data out of the Moscow lab and to analyze it and to prove that it had been tampered with. And once it was exposed, it was almost laughable, but it was touch and go whether it would get exposed. And they accepted all of that incredibly complicated evidence, accepted all of that, accepted there was non-compliance, accepted that Rusada was liable for, strictly liable for the um, corrupt conduct of the Russian authorities, virtually named them up to the top and agreed that there needed to be very, very severe sanctions in order to punish the wrongdoing. But also uh, the most important thing, what in English law we call the Bolton Principles, to maintain public confidence in the system, in the ability of the system to provoke behavioral change. And it was that, that was the standard that the committee um, stood against when it said, how far do we need to go? Four years um, worth of consequences, exclusion from the Olympics, exclusion from world championships, et cetera, for four years. And the panel came with us all that, that far, and they said, but we think what's being proposed goes further than is necessary, so we're going to roll it back. And I have to say, some of the analysis, well, there isn't a lot of analysis that supports that. Um, and, you know, all I can say is I hope they're right, because there needs to be a fundamental change, because, you know, every, every month, every quarter, we are finding new revelations about, about Russia and the and the consequences of the conspiracy there. So that's that one. Leaper is another one where I was advocate for world athletics. Fascinating case, I would say, because it comes very much in the stead of the Semenya case, which was in both cases, it, these are, all, I would say almost pure sports law. I'd be interested in your, to your views because this is just about drawing lines, boundaries in competition in order to try and define what is fair competition and to create a, a pitch or a court or whatever where what counts and what will, what will um, win the event is your talent, your skill, your dedication, your ability, luck, etc., and no other extraneous improper factors. And that must be sports law at its purest to be able to defend those lines. And in both cases, what was fascinating, still fascinating, in both of them, we are drawn into a much wider social debate about uh, inclusion and exclusion. Uh, and in both of them, we struggled very hard to, to explain to people that no one wants discrimination, no one wants unequal treatment, but not all discrimination is unlawful or improper. And as Adam has just said, if you identify a legitimate objective and the CAS in both cases recognized that creating and protecting the conditions for fair and meaningful competition is a legitimate objective, then if what you do goes no further than is necessary to achieve that objective, then it's gonna be defendable. In both cases, you know, World Athletics says we are inclusive, we want everyone to compete, we don't want to exclude people, and yet it was excluding people in the end. Um, and I think you can square that circle very straightforwardly, but it does require people to think about it, because many people say discrimination is unlawful. Actually, being, dis being discriminating used to be a, a compliment, right? You discriminate between good people and bad people, good book and a bad book, whatever. That's supposed to be a good thing. So 
there's it, it's a fascinating but, case and sorry just one last point it also and this is something i do see this as a, a tidal wave coming towards us the the impact of the human rights lobby and the human rights analysis is really important and i definitely don't agree with everything that is said in the human rights lobby but i do agree that sports bodies need to learn the language need to embed in their processes a consideration of human rights. At the moment, it feels almost as if the two ships are passing in the night. They talk a different vocabulary, start from very different premises, and just miss each other's point. Mm. Now, there's no, there's no, there shouldn't be any suggestion that world athletics wants to infringe people's rights, wants to be anything other than inclusive, and instead, it's a, a balancing act of the different uh, of the different. Um, rights that are in conflict. Sorry, one last thing, and then I promise I'll shut up. <laughs> you said one last thing. <laughs> I know. I promise after this. The other fascinating thing about those cases is that the CAS has come under enormous attack. People saying, well, it's obviously not capable of protecting people's human rights because it didn't protect Semenya and didn't protect Lipa. Well, actually, in the CAS, in the, in the Semenya case, the CAS, the judge was not only a federal uh, judge in Australia, but also a PhD scientist. Probably no one in the world better at taking that case. And they did a very careful analysis. And it was it went up to the Swiss Federal Tribunal and said they did a very careful analysis. And yet you have the human rights lobby saying, well, the fact that she lost shows that Cass is incapable of protecting people's human rights. Now, I have a few things I would say about Cass, but in fact... I don't see any reason why the, some of the very good arbitrators there at CAS can't, can't deal properly with human rights challenges. I'd be interested, Adam, in your view, but you've got to tell us your two important cases. Well, I think my, my view on, on yours is, I mean, one, it's, it is almost one of the most intractable um, uh, conflicts between two competing human rights. And at the end of the day, everybody's, rights can only be um, relied upon to the extent that it doesn't disproportionately affect somebody else in, in another right. And I, I think that uh, those cases are a victim of the fact that society as a whole hasn't actually squared uh, this particular um, balance. Um, so while sport sets the the boundaries, the dividing groups by reference to what it perceives society sets those boundaries at. The whole point is that the, the, the lobby is trying to change that and, and has very good arguments as to why to change it. I mean, that's that, that, the problem is both sides has very, very good arguments and there isn't an obvious compromise. And, and so society needs to sort this out and then I think sport will follow. That's my view on that. But well, I was, was going to say that I think it's a great point, though, that you make, John, about the use of language, because over the last couple of years in particular, I've had various conversations with ev on all sides. And often there is this confusion over language and particularly those who are really quite deep into human rights. They assume they had assumed, um, particularly around issues around Rule 50, for example, is one of our editorial board members, Nikki Dryden, who wrote a great piece for us on that, which she was opposed to some of the stuff going on with Rule 50, spoke to some athletes, and they were actually surprisingly encouraging of Rule 50 uh, by OOC. And she was quite shocked because she was so used to being around people who were just opposed to it. She didn't see the other side of the argument. And when she did, she really thought, actually, let's adopt kind of the approach, Adam, that you were saying, right? Let's actually have some dialogue. Let's speak to what's going on. Let's see if we can find a better method and, uh, to move forward. And then particularly that seems to be the case also with the human rights movement. Um, but I, I, yeah, I like the fact that you're saying that I think there's going to be, you know, more dialogue um, and the lobby are, are much more engaged in the Center for Human, International Center for Human Rights. No, John, you've spoken at one of the events they've put together. Um, it's very encouraging. Um, Adam, uh, oh, sorry, the one other thing I was going to mention is that... Uh, uh, would you agree that we should refer to when we talk about cast decisions? Maybe I'm a bit pernickety about this. That we should refer to a cast panel, just because you may have night and day decisions at times. Doesn't happen that often, but you can have night and day decisions. So when we're referring, I think for the for, for example, the sports executives or administrators or people who aren't the sports lawyers watching this, they know that that's what you meant. But should we refer to cast panels rather than just CAS, rather than applying that it was an institution line of uh, thinking? Um, do you agree with that? Or? Yeah. Um, 
Um, and then, um, Adam, what are your sort of key cases? Uh, so uh, I, I think for my part, what I'm most interested in, or, and it's probably a function of the, the, the particular work that I've been doing in the last year anyway, is the, uh, is the tension between the approach to competition law challenges that was taken uh, by the tribunal in the Saracens case, when compared with the approach taken, for example, by the European Court of Justice in the International Skating Union case, and uh, what I saw in the Saracens case, which took some considerable time, um, uh, was a very rigorous approach to the application of competition law. And if you are going to challenge a sports governing body rule as being contrary to competition law, then you have to deal with the particular hurdles that competition law throws up for you and what then might be perceived as disappointing from the point of view of a, of a competition lawyer uh, in this jurisdiction at any rate is that you have a decision like the ISU decision which effectively says those sports governing bodies are subject to rules under competition law which effectively means they have to do everything um, they have to pursue a legitimate aim proportionally. Now, of course, that is the ultimate point, but it, there's a lot more complexity to a competition law case than simply saying a sports governing body is in a dominant position and therefore must act fairly. I mean, those sort of standards can be found elsewhere, and they're not necessarily the same standards as under competition law. So what, what we, we will see, unfortunately, is a lot of people relying on the ISU case and saying, oh, well, look, you're a sports governing body, and you haven't acted proportionally. Now, I know I said at the outset that that's ultimately the, the bottom line, but, but it does seem to me that if people are going to have a go at you through a competition law case, then they've got to plead a proper competition law case and they've got to prove a proper competition law case. And there are a large number of aspects, for example, in the context of the salary cap, where the initial abuse of, uh, or of any dominant position is not established or where the initial effect on competition is not established. And it seems to me that is something that we'll probably, post-Brexit, we'll probably find English courts willing to carry on uh, taking that, that stance. Certainly, if on that panel there are practitioners who are experienced in competition. And so do you, do you, do you believe then that we're going to see um, much greater sort of focus and expertise on competition or expertise within international federations, uh, in in-house in capacity, as well as those practitioners who currently maybe, you know, either are traditional sports lawyers or maybe, you know, more just focused on competition uh, generally going to be more involved in sport? Well, actually, no, funnily enough. <laughs> I mean, for, my, for my part, I think that the Saracens case will have poured a, a bucket of cold water over uh out and out competition law claims. And they, they, they didn't succeed in the QPR case. They didn't succeed in the uh, Saracens case. And I wonder whether did, or sorry, not- Sorry, did, didn't, Adam, didn't the QPR settle though? Uh, well, it, it, it did settle and it did settle um, uh, before it went to the final tribunal that, that, it, that it would have gone to. But um, I don't think that alters the fact that the judgment that is, complete and has not been overturned, rejects the competition law case, and it is then referred to in the Saracens case. So you can look at the Saracens case and understand that they've endorsed the approach taken in the QPR case. And you can see, therefore, that an out and out competition law case does face very, very considerable problems. I think my concern is that what we may be seeing, and I think you see it in some sense, from the way in which challenges were being put to COVID emergency measures, is that people may be beginning to say, well, we don't need to go down this competition. We're just going to say this is all a Bradley challenge. We're going to say that this is in breach of the Bradley principles. And obviously, if it's rank enough, then, uh, then it may be. So, Adam, can you just explain the Bradley principles, please? So the Bradley principles are the principles which say that although the uh, relationship between, let's say, a club and a sports governing body is a private law one, uh, there may be bases for reviewing the action. A court may step in to review the action of the sports governing body on the basis of uh, principles which are similar and analogous to the principles in the context of public law. So 
was there a breach of the law or a breach of the rules? Has there been some sort of procedural unfairness in a process that was laid down? Uh, is the decision one which steps outside the range of uh, decisions reasonably open to a sports governing body having the contractual powers that it does to regulate the sport? And so I, I suspect that people may start arguing that those principles are enough to get them over the line in their challenges to the way that sports governing bodies have acted. Um, whether they succeed in that is, is another question, because what we have also seen from the response of arbitral tribunals to the pandemic emergency measures is that tribunals were prepared to afford a very wide margin of discretion to the sports governing bodies in the context that, that, had, that had there um, applied. So it, 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 it's interesting that the, the, the putative big bad wolf is sitting back a bit and having a bit of a think about which way they're going to blow, I think. And, uh, you know, you lost me on that quite a we Is the big bad wolf the governing uh, body? Is that, that's no, the three no, little pigs. No, we're the three little pigs, John. Oh, okay. I've got the it. governing bodies are the three little pigs. They're building houses. Some <laughs> of the houses are good. Some of the houses aren't. There I've are people it. who are trying to blow the houses down. <laughs> and it's not fair to say that the people who are trying to blow the houses down are the big bad wolf. You might think of them as such, but they're not. They're simply um, acting on, on the best interests of their clients and challenging in the, within the parameters of the law as the law entitles them to do the, 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 the way in which the house is set up. So my... my point is they're not big bad wolf, but the houses have to be better we're going to change the front cover of the book quickly put a picture of three little pigs you know on the front i'm feeling like my prep wasn't the right type of prep there's me focusing on the book and i should have been picking up my kids <laughs> nursery stories um, it, all comes down to children's stories exactly I'm, I'm presuming you're keeping it simple for me <laughs> but anyway um so one of the things on that and, and you probably know I interviewed Lord Dyson following the Saracens case, and he was you know, quite vehement in this, felt, felt that, well, he didn't really understand why there was such an objection to publishing the award. And, and I asked him the question whether or not he felt that, given the public interest in sport, that um, you know, these decisions should be more widely available. And his view was, you know, he did say within, you know, with certain um, caveats, you know, in, in certain cases where privacy needs to be protected, you know, people's identity needs protected, you can blank it out. But in the main, he kind of felt that they, sh well, he said that they, sh in his view, he doesn't see any reason why these, lots of these decisions shouldn't be published. And so, say, for example, in the QPR case, I know that there was uh, a fantastic amount of research that was done on that case and from, you know, from all parties who have been involved in it. They haven't told me any of the details of it, but they said there was a fantastic amount of, of data that was put forward. That would be very, very useful, and I understand the competing interests for the individual parties, but very, very useful, obviously, for everyone else in the sports market to actually understand what some of these, the principles and, and application that was discussed in those cases. Do you have any view on the sort of publication of awards? Do you have a general view? or I, I'll go first, Adam. Um, yes, I do very much. You know, people say arbitrations are confidential, but most arbitrations are private disputes about bipartite agreements. When they are about rules that have to be applied again and again and again, not to have the decisions published detracts from the rule of law, detracts from legal certainty. And I don't see good reasons for it. Obviously, redact, you, know, you can redact things that are particularly private or confidential, but the, the legal principles themselves. In fact, you've reminded me, one of the reasons we did the book in the first place, back in 2003, when you were still a baby, was because we would go to court, and Adam, I know you'll remember this, and we'd have a case and the other side wouldn't have it, or they'd have a case and we wouldn't have a copy of it. And that was just ridiculous. That just seemed stupid. And that was one of the reasons why we spent all that time gathering together all the cases and citing them so that, that you know, it, it was more transparent. And that is a sign of maturity. Well, that was a sign of incredible immaturity. But now most decisions are published. You know, you can actually search the CAS database now and even find things sometimes. <laughs> so it, uh, I'm not saying it's perfect, but I, I have a very clear view that this stuff should be published. It will improve the quality of it and it will improve the quality of future decisions. 
uh, I have a rather more nuanced uh, view of, than, than John's on that. So let's that won't be the first time today. <laughs> or the last. I don't think you'd have said it was nuanced, but, it, but, but yes, it's a different view to, to John's. And I think that the problem is that the circumstances vary quite considerably. So to take a doping case, I can quite see that you might want to have the way in which the prin principles have been worked out by the tribunal uh, put out in order to allow people to understand the legal principles and to understand the parameters within which they are acting, and therefore that uh, athletes should know what the principles are when they're defending a case. But what is the position if um, somebody is acquitted? Uh, is the suggestion then that, first of all, you should publicize a, a doping charge against somebody whenever it's made? And I think the answer John would give is, yes, you should. It's just the same as a criminal case. And therefore, the acquittal follows from it. Um, and that is all to do with the, the, the Wada's idea that the more transparency there is in relation to uh, the process, the more dissuasive the process may be. But I'm, I'm, I'm still not entirely convinced that that best protects the in interests of the individual who has been wrongly charged with a doping offence and is then acquitted and is then paraded notwithstanding as having been somebody, oh, they, they, they were in a doping case, they must have done it, they just got away with it. So I think it's a little bit more complicated, even in the context of a disciplinary matter like that. It's certainly much more complex when one moves away from disciplinary decisions, which are effectively decisions about doping or decisions about misconduct, and, and you arrive at something where you have, for example, a contractual league, which is made up of its members, it is, uh, the, the, it is let's say 20 members if it's the premier league they're in a contract with one another and they have a, an arbitration agreement that relates to how they uh, uh, regulate uh, or how they solve disputes in relation to a particular aspect of the contract between them and how that works and what people can and can't do and they have decided very clearly that that as part of their joint venture, they have a dispute resolution system which resolves their contractual disputes in a way that should not be public. It, it, it is a matter which they want to keep private because they have, for example, very strong interests in the maintenance of the, uh, of the reputation of the competition. The competition is being sold around the world and so on. So, why should the normal principle of arbitral confidentiality in any sense be disturbed by the fact that the public might be interested in it? Well, the public might well be interested in it, but that doesn't mean it's in the public interest. But, but Adam, that wouldn't there be... Sean, sure, Adam, that wasn't why I said it should be. I, I, did I say anything about public interest in it? <laughs> no. But, so, but it's a good response to an argument I didn't make. Sean did it, to be fair. I did, yeah. So, uh, Adam, though, isn't one of the arguments, though, say, for example, in the Premier League, obviously a dominant league, uh, incredible organisation, um, you know, and, and, I, and I'm obviously very sympathetic and understand the points that you've articulated, but isn't one of the other points that there are other parties who are affected, whether it's the players, whether it's, um, you know, the councils, whether it's the, you know, the, the, you know, the schools that they work with. It's not just, they're not, the, even the Premier League themselves are not just a commercial body in a sense of, in, in, if you looked at actually what their activities were, and let alone taking into the, the fact that the, you've got the Football League and the Premier League and, you know, the relationship there, which is a, a, a tricky one, and then with the FA again. Um, so it makes it slightly more, you know, in one aspect, I can totally see and say they're a business and being an entrepreneur, I'm very sympathetic to that. But when you overlay all the complexities of, of, of football, it starts to get a bit, it's, you know, maybe it's my naive analysis, but it seems to me to be slightly more complex than that. Well, it may be in a given case. It may be that there are genuinely aspects of something which would make it in the public interest to depart from the norm. And that possibility arises under the um, Bankers Trust case. It, it is there, it is a possibility that the court will have to decide if it goes to a court what it, what it does about that. But it, so long as it doesn't go to a court, it is a private arbitral decision. 
And that is a private matter between the parties and the, the confidentiality continues to exist unless the court decides otherwise. And, and of course, uh, oh, sorry, Adam, go on. No, for my part, I don't have a particular problem with that. I mean, I can, I can see that you might want, as a matter of policy, clubs and the league of which they're a member or, 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 or the governing body of which they're a member might want to debate the possibility of not doing that in the future. They can do that, but it, as a matter of law, there's no reason, in fact, to depart from the fact that they've chosen to, to act on a private basis. Now, whether or not you've changed the law, in, in a sense, or you change the essential fact of what the contractual agreement is between the people involved is, is another question. But in terms of the way it is now, it's entirely justifiable and right that the, the, the contractual confidentiality should be enforced, to my mind. Thank and you. you can certainly see that the smaller the transaction, the number of parties, you can see that, can't you? That gets stronger and stronger until when it's bilateral, it's almost impregnable. If you're talking about a set of rules that apply across the world and are supposed to be applied consistently across the world, it's rather more difficult to have um, yeah. private decisions. And of course, yeah. if you had a situation where the only decisions that weren't published were the ones that exonerated the athletes, that would be pretty unfair to other no, athletes. I can see that too. I can see that too. I have to say, I'd like to broaden out that point. One of what there is a, a lot more material in this next edition of the book on governance. And there's a reason for that. I always thought governance was incredibly boring and not very relevant. Yeah. I have come round very much to the view that actually it's fundamental yeah. and that every decision that is made is based on the decision-making framework, which is a matter of governance. I, I, I recently, we published, because we're so transparent, a, a, I chaired a commission that looked into wrongdoing, alleged wrongdoing in biathlon. And all we did was decide if there's a case to answer. We haven't charged anyone, we haven't pub, found anything, but we published a 200 page report with evidence in it, with proper caveats, but we were as transparent as can be. We did maximization before publication. And one of the reasons we did that is because we were describing a course of conduct over 15, 20 years in an international federation, where, which was corrupt conduct, but it was born out, born out entirely of utterly inept governance controls. So it was you know, no term limits, 25 year president, no checks and balances, no independent decision making uh, when it came to integrity decisions and no vetting of people for eligibility requirements. Now, we can all shake our heads at that, but actually that's still, it's not, I wouldn't say it's the norm anymore, but it's still hard to find many federations that can tick all of the boxes. And there's a very interesting move now towards saying, well, I mean, I've, I've sat with SEBCO, World, World Athletics, saying we, we didn't want to give up our authority over integrity decisions. We thought that's our job to control the sport. We should control the sport. We should make those decisions. But you know what? Giving it over to an independent integrity unit has been a revelation for us. It, everyone was terrified about it, but it is, has turned out to be very much for the best, at least I don't want to put words in his mouth. I think he would say that. I'm going to be asking him and we'll find out um, for the book because he helped. Nice, he was very nice, wrote a foreword for us. We've, I've seen that more and more. And Adam, you've seen it. Every, every governing body has stakeholder representation and people in the Exco who are institutionally and therefore inevitably and unavoidably conflicted so that they could be Jesus Christ and the disciples when they make their decisions, but people will attack them or doubt them because they are under a conflict. And yeah. so, and you saw this in this investigation, the people in the executive committee, they have their commercial partners that they've sold the rights to saying, look, for Christ's sake, these scandals, these doping issues all the time, this is just really bad for the sport and it's bad for the value of the rights. Different constituents, all of these people coming in, and so they can't make a pure decision or they can't focus and say, 
above all, we've got to ma maintain public confidence in the robustness of the system. So if you give that to an independent body, and it's only happened a couple of times now, Athletics Integrity Unit, Biathlon has one now, there are a few others. I'm really interested to see where that goes. But the fundamental point, and it's why we've got a couple of chapters in the book, is governance isn't boring. It's actually, you know, it's actually fundamental. But, I'm never going to say that about data protection, but I will say that. About, <laughs> I'll, you know, I'll, I'll turn you on data protection. It's, it's quite interesting. But anyway. <laughs> can, I, can I just add to that? I mean, and sometimes the, the, the actually just publication and thorough independent examination of something is the only way cathartically to get over a problem or a perception of problem that a sport has. So in the tennis integrity inquiry, the, the, the review, we, it, that was the only way in which to do it. So quite apart from the forward looking section of that, which recommends how one deals with uh, a, 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 a betting problem within a sport, um, how, the, the other half of that review was that in order to examine all these long-term allegations that have been made about the sport and about the governance of the sport and about how people had, had, had approached it. And the only way to deal with that was, as the sport anticipated and as the sport decided, put it all out in the open, get somebody independent to look at it, and then people can look at it and it'll draw a line under it. And then we'll make the changes for the future that we can learn uh, should be made from that. So uh, uh, it seems to me, and again, when I've looked at this and I spoke to Maria Clark on a couple of occasions, who I think was the co-author of that chapter. Yeah. Is that right? Yeah. Who, 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 who I really she, She's done a lot of work in this space. Very yeah, good. exactly. Yeah. And she's, she's got such, a, and, and, and we talked about this and we kind of, I think we, we agree that it's quite simple at times in terms of the approach that should be taken. And in fact, I'm not sure what happens in the mix of everyone trying to get the sport running and all the different competing interests. They lose sight of, as you were saying, John, of the framework that they need to follow. And obviously when the AIU was set up, I was really, I looked into it with a critical eye because I thought to myself, mm, that sounds really good. Is it just a bit of lip service that you have this very convenient independent body? And then as I went through it and I've written an article on this to draw out these key points, the thing that I loved was the vetting panel. And I had the pleasure of interviewing Michael Beloff, you see, um, who said he went under greatest scrutiny. He knows scrutiny. nothing about sports. <laughs> yeah, what does he know? But the, he, um, he said he went under greater scrutiny from the vetting process with the AIU than he did um, when he was, a, I think, a Privy Council judge. In terms of it was so thorough, he was being asked all these different questions, which gave me huge amounts of reassurance. But also, not only did they have vetting for the officials, they had different types of vetting depending where you are within the organization. So, from your perspectives, then you think that this, let's say, almost like you have in the corporate world, a you know, a sort of uh, a very straightforward structure. It's not always, you know, it's fallible. It's got, you know, it's not, you know, it's not a perfect system, but it's going to be the sort of uh, a movement going forward and, and having these separate integrity functions. And I love the fact that you're saying, Adam, which seems to be the big problem in sport that we're seeing is that, you know, when's the right time to reform? Because people are worried about if they can draw a line or not. And so they hold on and hold on and hold on rather than relinquish some of their power. Well, look, on that point, if you look at World Athletics and, and Biathlon, two organisations I know something about, both of them hit by an enormous crisis, right? President accused of taking bribes from Russian authorities to bury doping cases. Couldn't be more fundamental. Both of them went through a process of complete reform of their constitution to install proper governance uh, uh, controls, uh, checks and balances, independence at the right places, and transparency, because transparency is remarkable at how it improves decision-making. And they also did what Adam did with the te Tennis Integrity Review. They both appointed bodies to, to dig out what had happened and to dig it out in a way that people could have confidence in. And now I don't think it's going too far to say that they were, are both seen as leaders in the field, as strong governing bodies. But neither of them perfect, don't get me wrong, but to turn it from the depths where they were to where they are now, to me, tells us something. And I do hope, I mean, the problem with writing these bloody reports, I'm sure Adam will agree, is there's a danger they get put on the shelf and never referred to. But we've said in this biathlon one, look, International federations should look, national federations should look 
Do they have the right governance controls? Are they asking the right questions? Because, you know, the, t the people will be asking those questions of them and they better have a good answer to them. Doesn't mean, doesn't mean everyone's going to run out and make these changes. But, you know, we are, we've seen the end of 40, 50 year presidents. None of them end well. Right. And do you think do you think that this is going to become something where it applies sort of indirect competitive pressure from the perspective if you're a sponsor and you're looking to invest into a sport where where do you put your money you'd put it where they've got, actually got you know a robust governance you'd like to think anyway um, I'd like to think you know, you, yeah they have a robust governance structure and, and, and independent integrity bodies uh, to make sure that they're not going to be caught up in one of these scandals that kind of brings me on to. Um, yeah, we have, and I'm loath to talk about it because I think we're all sick of it, but the, the pandemic and the financial pressures um, that are placed under sport and, and, and political pressures as well. Um, do you think that's accelerated sort of changes to governance or the approach to that sports are taking towards, um, at, you know, at least financial regulation um, that, that we saw pr like pre-pandemic? Adam? Well, it's changed the it's changed the factual matrix against which regulation is going to have to continue, and therefore, it at some level leads to uh, some form of reappraisal of the rules that are going to be in place, whether it be proposals from big picture down to other proposals. So there is, it has accelerated the idea that there's got to be a new look at the way in which this is done. And therefore it alters the, 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 the matrix against which the regulation will continue. But does it mean in itself that the form of the regulation should be substantially different i'm not sure um but then again that's the that's the process that will be gone through and there are certainly people who will be saying that the form of financial regulation should be very different but again they will be those people who have particular interests so if someone comes along and says oh this particular rule should be done away with you have to always ask the, the, the question who benefits and the answer will almost inevitably be that it's the people who are making the point that will benefit. And they probably are not taking into account to quite the same extent who will be harmed. And so, so I thought the they were the big the bad wolf. Body the, is to balance that. I thought that they were, they're not allowed to call them the big bad wolf. They're, they're, <laughs> they're not a big bad wolf simply because they're running their point. They're not a big bad wolf simply because they're taking their side of side of things. But it doesn't mean that they're also, you know, right. There has and, to be a so, so the key point there, though, I think that you mentioned, Adam, which I think you know is, is a good one, is that the, it's 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 either caused or, or or at least led to some reappraisal, which is pro inevitably. Um, going to lead to at least having a better understanding why existing uh, approaches were there or that highlight, no doubt, that there needs to be some change. Um, I'll tell you what, um, Sean, it's led to a reappraisal of every law firm's precedent bank of force majeure clauses. I can <laughs> promise you it's led to a significant and profound reappraisal of that. I like those um, non-contentious lawyers who churn out these contracts without ever bothering to read any of the boilerplate. And now they're like, oh, what did we say about force majeure in that contract? <laughs> so that's what we've been spending the last year and a half looking at, all those non-contentious lawyers and their dodgy force majeure clauses. I must say, I know a few people who've had a, a miserable <laughs> few months go through it, every single contract they've drawn up. Um, one of the, uh, let's say, evolving areas in sport is the relationship with betting. And obviously, both of you know a thing or two about this, Adam in particular, given the uh, Tennis Integrity Report. Um, what issues do you think are created by the relationship with betting? And how do you see that relationship developing over the, the coming years? Because they are such a sizable contributor for, financially to the sports market. Yeah, well, so uh, I think what I learned through the, um, the tennis thing was that uh, it, it's not 
enough to say that uh, the people who are the players who, whether they give information about their matches or whether or not they tank, it's not enough to either, either characterize them as the villains and spend your entire time trying to catch them and punishing them and kicking them out of the sport. Um, first of all, you have to look at the circumstances which have put them in that position. Secondly, ex post punishment and supposed deterrence is marginal in its effectiveness. It's an essential element. You have to have it there. You have to do it. And you have to do it fairly, but it's not enough in itself. So in order to cope with the, the impact of gambling on a sport, you have to look at the incentive structures which put people in the position where they do that. And you have to look at the opportunity that's provided to them to do it. And you have to look at the education of them to persuade them not to do it. And then only lastly, do you then start punishing them? So if you have a sport like tennis, where there are a large number of people who think of themselves as professional tennis players, although really they perhaps shouldn't, who come in at the bottom end of the sport thinking that they're going to be able to earn a living and then can't, and are then confronted with, how can I get moved from here to the next part of the swing of the tour that I want to be playing on? And they don't have any money to do it. And yet they are also someone who, because of the nature of the sport, might be thinking about not winning a match anyway because they want to move on to a tournament that would be more useful for them from the point of view of ranking. And they would therefore be someone who might be inclined to tank a match anyway. And then so what they do is they just bet on the fact that they're going to lose. Then that information becomes public. And then it, 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 it spirals into a situation where... They may throw matches in order to make money. They may become involved with uh, more uh, professional betting outfits to, to do that. So you've got to uh, look at that and you've got to assess whether or not you can alter that. But how do you alter that at a sport which doesn't have enough money in it to feed all the people who might want to be professionals? Difficult. So you then look at the, the, the opportunities and what's the phenomenon that's clear in, in tennis is that there are a large number of matches which are made available to um, uh, betting organizations. In other words, those matches are ones which are capable of being bet on because a betting operator puts them on a platform. And yet there is no ability to regulate those events. They may be in very small local parks, some of them, and those players are precisely the players who might be exposed to the, uh, uh, to the adverse incentive structure. So the question then is, well, really, what is the balance that is to be struck in terms of what matches should be capable of being bet on, what data should be capable of uh, being provided to betting operators in order for them to make markets on it? And the conclusion we reached in the tennis context was that a line could indeed be drawn where you are still providing data to matches uh, which um, would be bet on in any event, perhaps, because scouts might be sent, which do provide a sufficient number of opportunities to bet to, to keep a betting organization happy. Uh, and below that, that you should perhaps say, well, no, there shouldn't be data made available to such matches in order to protect the players in them to, 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 to remove them from the temptation of, that is created by their adverse incentive structure. And it does seem to me that there, that there needs to be a slightly more mature balance between the interests of the betting operators who are of course reflecting the interests of the betting public. There needs to be a balance between quite how much data should be made available. Do you really need? quite frankly, to be betting on a, 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 a very low level match uh, in a park? Um, or is it actually enough that the betting opportunities are provided at a sufficient level and lower, lower levels are protected so that there's less uh, opportunity for um, betting related corruption? So uh, it's much more than just catching people. It's much more than the international cooperation that's obviously necessary in order to catch people, it, it, you have to start from the bottom up. You have to address the incentives, you have to address the opportunities, 
And I think that the betting industry and sport need to come to a more mature accommodation as to exactly what level of, uh, of data should be sold. Can I, can I jump in on that to obviously uh, defer to uh, Adam who spent two or three years of his life uh, looking at that. So um, I, I certainly wouldn't disagree with any of that. What is interesting is that people see sport and betting is an integrity th threat, there's no doubt, but there's a whole other side of it, which is that the betting industry is a parasite on sport in some ways. It's ambushing sport to generate funds. And there are many who say we need to find a way to get a fair return from the betting industry and the benefit it takes and the large commercial revenues it generates on the back of sport. And that leads to some of the tensions that Adam's been addressing. But it does also lead to a, a very interesting area of law and another one we should have mentioned before when we talked about new chapters in the book. One of them is exploiting sports data rights. So we have a whole section on the commercial exploitation of sport media rights, sponsorship, image rights, merchandising. But we have a whole new chapter now just on exploitation of data rights. And that's not just gambling, coaching, uh, gaming, many other applications for it. Very interesting because it's a bit like uh, TV rights 30 years ago, it's a question about who actually owned them, right? But in terms of the exploitation, there is a real, very mature and very valuable market one that does need, as Adam says, to, to address as well integrity concerns. But uh, make no mistake about it, it, it we're talking about multi, multi-million dollar deals in some, in some yeah. sports. And so you know, another example of where the first three editions, we wouldn't have even thought about a data rights um, chapter, but, but now we have a, 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 a significant treatment of it. And on our annual conference, we had a, a panel on it and that on, on AI as well, which is super interesting. And there's a lot going on in that space more broadly with all the tech companies and the legal challenges around that that's, that's going to have uh, an impact on some of the businesses uh, in the sports sector and some of the sports organisations. So I'll, I'll, I'm going to take a clean, keen look at that uh, chapter when I get my hands on it. Um, in it's terms of looking at what the Australians do. So, I mean, the Australians yeah. are tackling this full on and uh, you, you have arrangements where effectively they, they institutionalize the obligation to reach a proper and mature arrangement, which protects interests, funds, the right that isn't perceived by some as a right, but the right to, 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 to exploit a sporting event um, in, in a way which is aimed at balancing it. Um, I mean, I think John says parasitical, but, but at the end of the day, an event happens and what a betting operator is doing is offering people the opportunity to bet on what the outcome of that event is. Where data comes in is that it is more um, because of the recent switch to in-play betting as the fundamental form of, of betting. So that the data is necessary in order for in-play betting to, to, to be as interesting as it is. And also you've got the, I mean, um, I mean if, you, if you say, I mean, why at the end of the day should the FA be able to say who can bet on who wins the FA Cup final with that being something that's public and then the answer being published in the press? Is that a, is that a right? And what sport has managed to do and has been fortuitously lucky with the way in which the technology has developed into in-play betting, but what it's been able to do is it does have control of the in-play data. And so if you want to bet in play, you need that data from the sports governing body. Um, and that is providing an opportunity which ought then also to be maturely exercised in a way that protects players and protects the individuals who would be tempted into situations which they shouldn't be tempted into um, while still allowing a proportionate amount of money to be received by the sports governing body and still allowing a proportionate amount of data to go to the uh, to go to the betting operator uh, there isn't really a reason why a sports governing body should be allowed to maximize the amount of money that it that it makes from it at the expense of the people who are actually at the bottom the people are the players 
So John says that the that the uh, that the betting operators are parasitic on the sports governing bodies' rights. Well, sports governing bodies are in a sense parasitic, without using the term pejoratively, on the individuals who play. So it comes down to the individuals at the beginning of the, of the process, and you shouldn't be exploiting them in a way that actually is prejudicial to them. Well, I didn't realise that's what I was proposing, but sports governing uh, bodies don't have shareholders that they're paying dividends to either, right? They are generating funds to put back into the sport to create coaching and development opportunities to identify new players and well, bring them along the development pathway, bring them to the top of the sport and have a wonderful virtuous circle. Well, well all true. Three Little Pigs are very good, nice people, Adam. All, all, well, all true, of course, but except when you come into a situation, for example, like in tennis, where you have different governing bodies, so that you have um, some governing bodies that are responsible for, for, for a rather small group of elite players and some governing bodies that are responsible for rather a larger, larger group and also the grassroots. And then, then it becomes very difficult to, to, to balance. I, I mean, I accept that you should be making money to reinvest in the, in the grassroots, but you shouldn't do it at the simultaneous expense of the conditions at the grassroots. And, and doesn't this get more complicated by the fact that you've got data, obviously, and there, an argument for more data is that it creates more fan engagement, right, wherever a fan is maybe consumer again to be, you know you can debate that um uh and then with that also given the financial pressures under covid and with the relationship between certain relationships between governing bodies and betting companies and media agencies and with now with private equity looking to come in adds a further level of complication because who you're trying to serve as a stakeholder changes greatly as, as john's point are you trying to serve or is your responsibility more to your shareholders or the private equity fund who's invested to get the return on investment, or is it to the participants? I think it's so interesting. How do you see that dynamic um, impacting the sort of sports media rights landscape? I know that we've had, and I guess data rights now as well, that we've had this, um, you know, everyone reviewing their contracts over the last 12 months. Um, how, how do you see that playing out over the, and, you know, it, with the changes that have happened, do you think if there have been any think are notable do you think they will last adam well i, I think i think the principal difficulty there is the difficulty that, that has been exposed by the, the the european commission and by the european court for a very long time which is that how you allow a sports governing body to fulfill its regulatory aims in other words its proper regulation of the sport in the interests of all the stakeholders all balance when it has intense commercial interests as well. And so uh, long, long time ago, Formula One is split between the, the, the FIA and the commercial arms in order to uh, take that into account. The Moto case takes it into account. There are other instances, there are continual instances about how regulatory action can be taken in circumstances where it may impinge on the ability of rival competitions to, 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 to start. And as you see uh, increased commercial investment in uh, governing bodies that fulfill regulatory functions, then so too you are going to see this conflict or this tension, this dynamic uh, being exposed to, to a greater extent and, and, how do you, and therefore having to be carefully calculated. And how do you see that being affected by sort of breakaway leagues? We've had all this talk about, you know, the European Super League and, you know, pretty much, you know, a lot of interest from uh, a movement from private equity funds with former NBA staff, NFL staff who have got these closed league systems. At what point does that become... How is that affected when you know some of these breakaway leagues will say, "Well, we're not part of a governing body. We don't want to be part of a governing body structure. We are independent commercial entity. Basically, you know those concerns aren't a concern of ours. How how is that impacted by that, or is that something we're going to see, like the ISU case, be um, you know more hotly debated and, and challenged over the coming years? Um, yes, I think it will be. It will come up again, but we do need to 
at some level, particularly in the context of football, take a, uh, take the long view and look at what happened in the 90s and we have been here before um, and uh, so what happens is people raise their arguments they say they're not getting enough of the pie they raise their arguments and say they're going elsewhere and then the pie is looked at again yeah so <laughs> uh, 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 it, but, but but throughout this there is a there is a dynamic between proper regulation of the sport and the commercial interests, which has to be very carefully managed. But I don't think that necessarily the best interests of the sport are hived off by uh, somebody for purely commercial reasons, taking a part of the sport away from what have been the governing bodies in the past, because then who's going to regulate them? What's going to happen? How do I don't think the proposal would be to go that far, but the proposal would be that the competition would be separately arranged from the from the regulatory function. Uh, Sean, from for the lawyer sitting down and waiting for a, something to land on his desk, the question is: Okay, well, if you're the governing body or the event organizer, and your players are off, you know, considering competing in another event. What are the what are the do's and don'ts? What are you allowed to do? What are you entitled to do to protect the value of the collective that you've developed? And what aren't you entitled to do? I'll give you a, a, a maybe hopefully a good example. Adam's just been talking about there are certain types of event where you do not want to sell the data to the gambling um, bodies because of the integrity risks. Well, so what happens if a rival event organizer comes out? and they can pay more prize money. Why? Because they don't take on any of the development costs, any of the integrity costs, and they sell the data to the betting market. What do you say? Do you say, well, that's an unofficial event, so the integrity arm isn't going to har um, harm the official sport? You can't say that. That's nonsense. No one will distinguish between the two. So you would have thought that at least you could say, well, all right, if we're saying to our organisations... You can't organize or a match at this level. You can't sell the data to the gambling um, bodies. Then if this other event organizer is selling the data to the gambling bodies, creating the same integrity risk, that would seem to me to be a reason to say to players, we can't stop you from going, but if you go there, you can't do both. You can't come back. And that's only one example. You would hope that there are a number of other examples related to integrity, related to good and proper an effective regulation related to the development of the calendar. The interesting bit is when they're related to, well, I need the players to be committed to my tournament to generate the media agreement, which allows the payers to be played and also for me to finance the rest of the game. That's where there's still some unanswered questions. That's where it's going to take a brave governing body. But to me, it's the most interesting thing. If you're saying to players, you will benefit from this sport if you commit to these tournaments because we will get media contracts where we can pay you and use some money to prime the pump and develop more talent. And then a, along comes a, a parasitical a rival promoter who takes the benefit of your investment, avoids all of the costs, pays higher wages or prize money because of it, but in doing so undermines your collective, not just on integrity grounds, but bluntly on commercial grounds, there's, there's, we still don't know where, well, Adam, you may disagree, but I don't well, think, I think we know where, well, the, where the lines are drawn. Well, I think there's some guidance from the Asian Gulf Tour case, which seems to suggest that the, uh, the, the, the sort of my gang argument is viable to the extent that what you're saying is, well, if you want to participate in this tour, then you don't participate in another tour. But it's only reasonable to the extent that what you're actually doing is saying, if there's an event on day 20, you play in that event on day 20 rather than playing in an event somewhere else. And it seems to be premised on the proposition that the tour offers a really fair opportunity to make a living as a player. 
And if, on the other hand, the proposition is you can only play on our tour and you can't play in another tour on a different day, notwithstanding the fact that you can't earn a proper living at our tour, then that does appear to be unreasonable. So, I, I mean, I, I think there's some... It, it, it's, again, it's a question of proportionality and balance. And also, some of this is just common sense in the sense you don't want too much bad press either, right? If you upset your talent by locking them in and they're, yeah, they're going to struggle, particularly in the age of social media, it's going to uh, catch wind. What I think, uh, from what you said, is adds a level of uh, complexity, but also I think interest in this is you would like to think that a more reasonable outcome would be taken from governing bodies who have got the right structures in place to make sure that they're free from conflict during the decision-making process. And what we may see from, from this discussion is that in a few years' time, as everyone's craving to you know, try to fill some of the financial void that was there, maybe some decisions might be reached that may not be uh, in the best interest of the sport as a whole just because of the time pressures that are under. And therefore, some of the um, investors... Uh, the private investors, the, the, the you know the private equity funds, sovereign wealth funds, etc., maybe uh, um, maybe have more influence than than probably what they should have done. Um, that's a lot of obviously a lot of speculation, but you can see as we've seen in if history repeats itself, we've seen this happen before on a number of occasions, and you can see this seems to be like a prime opportunity uh, for that type of scenario to to emerge yet again. Well. It is remarkable how much private equity has seen opportunities to come in and solve some gaping financial holes caused by COVID, and they still see it as an important opportunity, and that's good. But you are right, and Adam is right, that it does, you know, it's one thing to answer to every stakeholder in the sport. It's another to answer to a private equity fund that wants a return on its investment. And so you had better make sure you've got, I mean, it depends who you are. If you are a, a event organizer with, with no broader responsibilities to the game, then that's one thing. But even there, you would want to have very careful protections to protect the integrity of your decision-making uh, so that it is not just about generating commercial, the highest possible commercial return. And that's a challenge. So I, I'm certainly not going, I've got several clients who are taking private equity investment, but it is something that they have, it's an additional element that both sides need to think about. But private equity fund, unless it's crazy, is going to understand that imperative on the other side and not going to want to screw that up. And so the question really is if they can be a value add, use the money to add value and increase the investment without compromising those other facets. But it's, it's new ground. Maybe there'll be a chapter in the fifth edition of the book on that. And um, finally then, and I was meant to ask this question earlier, but it's kind of relevant for this, given that we're talking about you know, how the sport is run, how they're spending their money wisely. And Adam, you've talked about the threat to sports if they don't redistribute the funds and bring, you know, help bring the, those at the bottom end uh, through quickly when they are either self-labeled as professionals or are professionals. To what degree, given everything we've seen around uh, the um, Black Lives Matter movement, uh, and particularly in certain sports where there's such a predominance of people from black and minority ethnic view, uh, backgrounds, overlaid with the lack of athlete representation historically on boards. To what degree do you think there's going to be a shift in the sort of both the diversity from you know from a broad perspective and also a diversity from an athlete's perspective in the governance of sport going forward? Um, can, can I start on that, Adam? Yeah. Um, look, I, I have helped to introduce in various organisations increased athlete representation around the decision-making table. And there is no doubt, I mean, sport is, a, is incredibly, uh, you know, it, it, it's governed by old white guys um, and it does not help the quality of the decision-making process quite how lacking in diversity it is. It's interesting about athletes because my, I, I have seen instances where, you know, athletes really, they say, we don't want to be involved. We want you to sort it out, us to rely on you and, and um, you know, leave us to focus on excelling at our sport. And then maybe when we've retired, then we would want to be involved. And that's a question actually is, well, are you ticking the box of athlete representation if you have someone who's retired? What about if they retired 
within three years? What about if they retired 10 years ago? I uh, can't remember if it was a law in sport, but some other panel where I got into quite an argument with someone because they said, I said, well, they were arguing about the wider board uh, and there's plenty to be said about the wider board, but they said there's no athletes on it. Actually, half the people on it were athletes, but apparently they're too old now to count as athletes. So um, I, I'm a full supporter and you see some fantastic people are doing it. It's actually quite a, a big ask to ask an elite performer performing at the top of their game to also sit around a committee table and take enough care to, to be able to contribute to decision-making on some of those issues because bluntly they shouldn't have to. They shouldn't be worried about it. It's a bit like being a partner in a law firm. You don't want to be worried about the back office. You want to be worried about you know, doing the work for the clients. But if I was an athlete, I would think I'd be the same. I'd be saying, for God's sake, do it yourself. I'm ready to contribute when I retire, but right now I don't really want to. So I'm not arguing that there shouldn't be active athletes on boards. The ones I've seen have been superb, but it's a pretty big ask of them. It really is. So um, I'm all for it, and I'm definitely for my more diversity. I, I, I won't say who I had a, um, a client, and I said to them, you should introduce a requirement for some gender diversity on your board. And they said, well, do you mean we have to have women on the board? And I said, well, yeah. And they said, but what if they propose people who are inexperienced and, and inadequate? I said, well, then it'll be a bit like the men on your board, won't it? It, it, didn't, it didn't go down well. But to me, it's indicative of the sort of thinking that we need to break through. I think it's a broader point than just athlete representation, to be honest. It's, it's, it's a much broader point than that. Yeah, it's, I, I think sport, because of its very particular position, is great interest to the public and a huge amount of public money is going into it in the sense of public individuals are spending money on sport, which is what leads ultimately, whether it would be through the broadcast contracts or, 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 or anything else, to the sport reaching the level that it does. Sport has a special responsibility to deal with societal problems of this level and therefore sport should be actively going ahead of the societal norm to actually make these changes and, 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 and it's very welcome that that is happening um, to an increased extent than, than it has before and it seems to me that sports governing bodies have an equal responsibility to get ahead of the curve and make the changes that are necessary uh, in order to deal with, with, with the particular problem and I don't think that that necessarily means that you have to have an individual athlete who's presently an athlete um, on the board, but what you do need is somebody who's coming at it from the athlete's plural uh, point of view. In other words, representatives who might be a former athlete. And I don't see that the fact that somebody is possibly a former athlete uh, it really undercuts their particular ability to put forward the athlete's Point of view, but to my mind, the diversity uh, approach has got to be a, a, a positive one, as opposed to simply reflecting the way society has reached at this stage because of sports special responsibility. Brilliant. Um, thank you. And I apologise if you can hear a screaming baby that's just turned up in the background. I'm not sure if that's you can hear that. <laughs> Um, it's the it's the it's the it's the new pandemic work life balance um, that's there. Um, it's been an absolute honour, uh, a pleasure to interview you both. Obviously, you've both helped influence me greatly in my career in sports law, uh, both through the interviews and the private discussions that we've had. But obviously, one of the first books that I read, amongst with a couple of others. Um, that I've talked about in the past was Lewis and Taylor. It was one of the first ones that people signposted me. So it's kind of like feels a bit full circle for me in some ways to do this interview. Um, but it's a, a real delight. Thank you for sharing your, your pearls of wisdom um, and obviously your analogies. <laughs> Adam, I'm going to go back and think about the big bad wolf again and, and try yeah. and really identify who that is. But I, the. I'm I'm still not sure about that one. Sean, it's, <laughs> not, a, it's a, not the big bad wolf, not to be characterised as the big oh, bad wolf. Oh, not to be. That's the bit we missed. That was the bit. Not Sean, it's, it's a great pleasure. I characterise them as the big bad wolf, but they're not the big bad wolf. They're simply people 
testing. Yeah, yeah, we've got it. We've got it. We've got it. We've got it. Sean, uh, this has reminded me, talking about a throwback, Adam and I used to teach a course on uh, at King's College on sports law. And what we used to do was sit at the front and just argue with each other for a couple of hours. It's reminded me a bit of that. Actually, it was quite a lot of fun. Hopefully it's educational, but I guess we'll find out. We'll, people will vote with their Zoom calls or whatever it is they do these days. No, Thank you. A, we, appreciate you uh, we appreciate talking about it and, and helping us to publicise the new book because... We do think it's worthwhile, at least I hope so, after all that bloody work for it. And so hopefully... <laughs> I'll be reading it. it. So you got that. Yeah, I can tell you that for, 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 for certain. But no, you know, particularly, you know, from... from I think the stuff that you've talked about, like you know, the 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 so the revisions are going to be worth noting, and it is an impressive amount of analysis and and uh, reference to case law. So you know, any disputes lawyer in in sports should have it ready to hand. Um, but also, I think that the the stuff you're talking about with the governance, I know there's an esports chapter in there, but particularly. I think a lot of those governing bodies that you refer to, a lot of participants in sport are struggling with the data side of things. So I think that chapter as well is one that I'm going to be taking a very, very uh, close look at. Um, Just think thank you how both. much bigger it would be if all of those decisions that Adam is hiding were made public and we had to refer to them as well. That would be another <laughs> thousand pages. So we should be pleased with him for not doing that. <laughs> Gentlemen, an absolute pleasure. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Cheers, Sean.